If you're not already there, go ahead and make your way to Leviticus 19. And we're going to be looking at the first 18 verses more broadly this morning. Last Sunday, I, we began looking at what it means for God to be holy. In verse 2, it records, You shall be holy, because I, the Lord, your God, am holy. So as review, holiness in its most basic form is that which is set apart or separate, or some theologians like the word otherness. And I mentioned last week that what makes God other than the rest of creation is that God alone has life in himself. He is self-existing, where everything else depends on God for life. So God is the very essence of life. All of God's perfections flow from who he is, which is absolute life. Therefore, to reflect God is to reflect life in the fullest sense. God's law, it reflects just that. It reflects life. Promoting those things that are life-giving and condemning those things that promote death. In fact, if you turn back a chapter to Leviticus 18, verse 5, the Lord reminds Moses concerning his commandments that if a person does them, he shall live by them. So the commandments are intended to promote life, not death. Now, the Apostle Paul, he picks up this verse in his letter to the Galatians, making a point to say that the law is not of faith, but that everyone who relies on the works of the law are under a curse. Now, some have taken this to mean that the law suggests that the Old Testament law is irrelevant for New Testament believers, because after all, we're under the covenant of grace. So the law, what does the law have to do with us? All that matters is faith. So why waste your time walking through a book like Leviticus? But understand, Paul never condemns the law. Ever. In fact, he never states in any way that the law is unholy, or that the law is unrighteous, or that the law is somehow bad or negative. He says the exact opposite. In Romans 7, he says the law is holy, and the commandments are holy and righteous and good. Furthermore, Paul even captures the idea that the law held forth the promise of life. The law held forth the promise of life itself. But that very command that promised life proved to be death to him and to you and to me because of our sin, our fallenness. So get this, there's nothing wrong with the law. The problem is in here. So while the, while the law doesn't offer life in itself, the law is a portrait of what life looks like, of what a holy life looks like before a holy God. The holiness that God demands, because to live contrary to God's law is to promote a culture of death. And therefore, it's not a reflection of God. Now, if this law in Leviticus is indeed God's holy law for his holy people, then there should be aspects of this law that are indeed otherworldly, that the world does not reflect. But here's the thing. Many of these concepts that Caleb just read for us in these first 18 verses of Leviticus 19, the world's perfectly fine with. The world at least to some degree, will agree with these ideas. Take verses 9 and 10. Don't strip your vineyards or your fields bare, but leave some for others. The world is good with the concept of sharing. The world's okay with, with sharing. Before Jenny and I were believers, we encouraged our children to share. Steve, you came to faith later in life. Did you teach your kids to share? When they were young? Absolutely. The world's good with that. In fact, most religions and worldviews promote nearly every word and concept from verse 11 
through the end of verse 18. Don't steal. Don't lie. Don't oppress. Don't act unjustly. Don't show partiality. Don't slander. Don't hate. Don't take revenge. But instead, love one another. But if the world knows these things, what is it that makes these commandments holy? We need to ask that question. What is it that makes these commandments holy? Well, first, because they're not actually lived out. And second, to the degree that they are lived out, they are not lived out in an honor of worship to a holy God. They are not lived, to, lived out to the glory of the living God. So get this. You and I, we do not need our Bibles to know the basics of the law of God that we sh and how we should treat one another. The Buddhist in Laos, he doesn't need a Bible to know that stealing is wrong. The Hindu in Delhi does not need God's word to know that it's not a good thing to lie to one another. The Shinto in Japan doesn't need to be taught to revere his family. They don't need a cop the Gideons to translate a copy in their native tongue and deliver it to them for them to know the precepts of God's law to love your neighbor well. In fact, your pluralist and agnostic neighbor doesn't need you to quote scripture to him or her to believe that loving others is a good idea. We don't, we don't need this. Why do we not need this? For that aspect. Because the world knows. It has always known. Paul makes this very point in Romans 2 when he says, when Gentiles, that is non-Jews who don't have the law of God, when Gentiles do what the law requires, they show that the law is written, the work of the law is written on their hearts. The work of the law is already written on their hearts, even though they do not have the law. And their consciences also bear witness, and their conflicting thoughts either accuse or excuse them before God. So having the written law is no advantage to the Jew because he will perish just as the Gentile will perish who doesn't have the written law. I can stand up here and recite the laws in Leviticus, every single one of them, until I'm blue in the face, and it will make absolutely no difference. Because hearing the law won't benefit you at all if you fail to live it out. Because it's not the hearers of the law who are justified before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. So while the entire world knows the rightness of these laws, it stops short of living them out. And so often you and I do too. But get this, if you and I fail to grow into conformity with the moral character of these laws, we will perish along with the world. Because without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Yes, in Christ, we have an alien righteousness. But if such righteousness remains alien, we will prove that we don't truly belong to Christ. But we don't belong to Jesus. Holiness is not optional for the believer. So now I need to address a seeming conflict we have between here with Paul's words in um, Romans 2 about the work of the law being written on the hearts of of even the Gentiles, and that of the new covenant promise of Jeremiah 31, which the New Testament quotes as well. Because where, where God himself promises to put his law within his people, writing it on their hearts. Because it's helpful for us to understand this for the holiness code of Leviticus, and particularly this list of commands that don't seem all that different or holy from what the world believes. So first, in Romans 2, Paul does not say that everyone has the law of God written on their hearts, per se. He says, 
the work of the law is written on their hearts. There's a difference. You see, when God fashioned us in his image, when God, or perhaps I should say, when God fashioned Adam and Eve in his image, his law was written on their hearts. They were made in the exact likeness of God himself. And, but with the fall, that law was severely marred, but the imprint, it's still there. Think of it like the two stone tablets that Moses carried down the mountains with the Ten Commandments on them. And he witnessed Israel quickly forsaking the God who brought them out of slavery in Egypt to worship a golden calf. And he shatters them at the foot of the mountain. While those tablets could no longer be read in their original design and the form of the, the way God originally gave them, traces of them could still be made out for sure. That's the work of the law written on every human heart. Apart, there, apart from Christ filling us with his spirit, every human being on the planet has traces of the law within. The imprint from chiseling the law on our hearts is still there. The imprint's there. But the beauty of the law fails to shine through as it was originally intended. Rather, we live out the law in brokenness and trace amounts here and there because we don't truly delight in the shards and fragments of God's imprint on our broken lives. The law is broken and the image is broken. So at the core of this holiness code is nothing less than the restoration of the Imago Dei, the image of God in us. The law it doesn't restore that image. It reveals what the image is to look like, how the image is to shine forth. But get this, doing the law doesn't make you or I holy. God does. Leviticus itself seeks to hammer this point home. No fewer than eight, mentioning this eight times over the next three chapters, that the Lord is the one who sanctifies. Look at Leviticus 20, verse 8. It says, keep my statutes and do them. I am the Lord who sanctifies you. God alone makes a people holy, not the law. However, upholding the law reveals that we are indeed His rather than counterfeits who merely espouse God's words with our mouth, giving lip service to his commands, but failing to live them out because people are far from him. Now, I mentioned that most religions and worldviews, they are fine with promoting every, nearly every word and concept from verse 11 through verse 18. I said nearly, but not every you see, the basis for the laws in Leviticus 19 is that God is holy, and therefore his people should be holy because he is the Lord. If we take verse 18 to be the climax of this chapter, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, I am the Lord. Then that phrase, I am the Lord, or one just like it, I am the Lord your God, shows up seven times on both sides sides of verse 18. Seven times on verse 18. Of course, seven being a holy number. And also, it bookends the chapter with this, with parallel phrases. Verse 2, you shall be holy for I, the Lord your God, am holy. And then verse 36, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. That word Lord, if you look closely, you'll see that your, your translation likely has Lord in small caps. Capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. The reason for that is because it stands for God's covenantal name, Yahweh. Why do I bring this up? Because the world is perfectly fine with the idea of going, doing good to others. But what it is not fine with is the foundation for doing good. That genuine, genuine goodness flows from the God who is. 
from Yahweh himself. Morality doesn't stem from some vague, abstract deity off in space, never to be seen or heard from again, but a personal God, the Lord of life who created you in his image to reflect his character, to be a reflection of the life that flows from him. What makes the law holy is that it reflects God and thus it glorifies him. But when the commands are obeyed as mere external motions and not as an act of worship to the giver of life, then the character of the law isn't truly lived out at all. It completely misses the point of the law. And that's why as much as the world may understand the outward precepts of the law, it fails to keep the holiness of this very law. Now what I want to do with the rest of our time is briefly, don't laugh, is briefly look at how these laws listed in the first half of chapter 19 are laws that promote life. With the climax being that of loving our neighbor well. And also how the world's concept of these laws falls short of holiness. I'm not going to read them since Caleb Ari was, was kind enough to read through um, these verses for us. Rather, I want to look at them more broadly. First, the command after the call to be holy, the very first command after the call to be holy is that of revering your mother and father. Verse 3. That word revere is the same word for fear. The fear of the Lord. The law of life begins here because right up front in contrast the difference between a culture of life and a disposition of death. To revere your father and mother is to reverence the means by which God gave you and me life. It is a portrait of fearing the heavenly father. Failing such, to show such reverence is to despise the gift of life and to despise its giver. Now, does the world hold to this concept of revering one's parents? It gives a lip service to the idea. A lot of the world likes that idea. But all you got to do is look at our culture and you see that many, they don't like this idea at all. How many shows and movies and, and media feeds do the exact opposite? They do everything but show reverence to the parents, especially the dad. And such, is a, such mockery is an overflow of how people truly think of their, as God as their Heavenly Father. I'm not at all saying that there aren't poor examples of parents in this world that you and I are, we're, we're a far cry from the perfect Father that our Heavenly Father is. But God, in His own goodwill, placed you in the particular family that you are for your good and for His glory because it is meant to point you to Him as your Father. All right, next, the Sabbath. As far as the Sabbath is concerned, and we've covered this in our Wednesday night class. The Sabbath is actually an expression of the goal of the climax of all of creation. And that is no less true now than it was for that very first week, creation week. You and I were created to enjoy rest in God. That was and still is to be the very culmination of life for humanity. That is not an old covenant idea. It is at the heart of the new covenant. Hebrews 4 says... There remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. So let us therefore strive to enter that rest. While the world may like the idea of regular times of rest, it doesn't like the idea of being told what that rest should look like. And definitely to rest in God. Moreover, the rest of the world seeks the rest, of, the rest that the rest of the world seeks isn't a rest in God. A lot of times it's rest in entertainment or rest in food and drink or some other substance that numbs us from reality. But entertainment, regardless of how much the world seeks to promote otherwise, isn't life. Food and drink are not life. In fact, Paul says the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit being the very presence of God 
within you. That's your life. That's the seal of the promised Sabbath rest we have in Christ. Idolatry. If we're looking at how these laws relate to that which is life versus that which promotes death, idolatry is the worship of dead things. False gods that have no breath in them, rather than worshiping the living triune God. The world has no qualms about idolatry, though. Instead, the world seeks to promote idolatry, which is why every aspect of the world's ethic ultimately leads to death because every supposed good deed is not an act of worship to the living God, but instead to worship of dead gods. And the most prominent idol that you and I tend to manufacture is ourselves. That's the one we tend to worship the most. Verses 5 to 8 have to do with profaning the peace offering or the sacrifices through which the Lord brings his people near for fellowship. This provision was through the death of another that you and I might have life. How might you and I profane the peace offering today? Because that's really what we got to look at. When we're looking at these commandments of Leviticus, how does that apply to us today? Well, by treating the Lord's sacrifice as common. By taking the amazing grace that we sang about, of the cross of Christ for granted. It's through Jesus' peace offering, his death in our place, that you and I have been granted life. And that should leave us in awe. Oh, the world seems to show some esteem for Jesus of Nazareth. He's a good person. He's a good teacher. He did good things for other people. And yes, he was wrongly condemned. But they dishonor him by rejecting his infinitely costly gift that is meant to restore people to the God they abhor. Last one we're going to look at as a broad overview. The remainder of these commands, verses 9 through 18, I believe can be summed up as this. Do not oppress, but love. Stealing. Dealing falsely, being slow to pay what's owed to another, showing partiality, slander, bitterness, and personal vengeance, they all fall under the broader category of oppression, seeking my advantage, my rights, my agenda over yours. Oppression discounts another person's life as less valuable than your own which is the opposite of what our Lord Jesus did for us, not counting equality with God as a thing to be grasped, but emptying himself as a servant for you and for me in order to die for you and me. So instead, we are called to love, and loving others seeks their good, and seeking one's good seeks to promote that which is life both physically and spiritually, seeking to restore people to their relationship with their creator. So verse 9, verses 9 and 10, not stripping your fields and your vineyards bare are not simply a matter of sharing. Teach your kids to share. That's not the core of the idea here. They are a portrait of living open-handedly as God has lived open-handedly to us and provides for us. That is how we are to love our neighbors well. So let's wrap up with how the New Testament handles this idea of loving, open, living open-handedly with resources of life as a means to love our neighbors well. James 2 says, If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? Do you know the context that James is speaking here? Well, first, the most immediate context is that of faith. A faith that fails to work, therefore, is not a salvific faith. Rather, it is merely 
a lip service type of faith that sees faith in Christ as nothing more than fire insurance because there's no transformation in their life. But there's another context behind James from which these commands flows because a lot of people will treat James like kind of like Leviticus, just a hodgepodge of different ideas and commands. But these commandments that James gives, the teaching that James gives, all flows out of what he refers to as the royal law and the law of liberty. What is this royal law? It's nothing less than Leviticus 19. James 2.8, if you really fulfill the royal law, according to the scripture, which is, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You do well. That is the royal law. For James, every failure to keep the law is summed up as a failure to keep the royal law of loving our neighbor well, whether that be oppression, partiality, murder, failure to live open-handedly with the resources that God has provided us so generously. So James goes on to say, we are to speak and to act as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. Why? Because judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. But in grace, mercy triumphs over judgment. Then the Apostle John, he says something similar. In 1 John 3, he writes, If anyone has the world's goods and sees his neighbor in need, yet closes his heart against him, how can God's love truly abide in him? Little children, hear John's plea. Little children, let us not love in word and talk, but in deed and in truth. The world, it loves in word and talk. The world has no problem advocating for what you and I should do and the good we should do for others. In fact, just look at, uh, you know, look at how our government and, and um, um, oh, I'm trying to think of the right word for them. But, but the people who promote, you got to do this, you got to do that. People are fine advocating what you and I should do with the resources God has given us to steward. But you know, um, but we're so much slower when it comes to doing such with what is our own. There's a disconnect there. The things we advocate for so strongly when it comes to what's in my own pocket, I'm a little bit slower to use that in the same way. God's love flows from the recipients of his love. We live open-handedly with physical resources of life because we know the author of life and the precious gift that he has given us in Christ Jesus. Love, genuine biblical love, is a holy attribute because it flows from knowing a holy God. Regardless of how much the world talks up the idea of true love, the world doesn't know genuine love because the world doesn't know the God who is love. In fact, this is how we know that the Bible promotes genuine love as otherworldly. Get that. Christian love is otherworldly. Jesus says that by our love for one another, people will know that we belong to Him, that we are no longer of this world. So how big of a deal is Leviticus 19? Well, first, not only does Jesus quote Leviticus 19 multiple times throughout his Sermon on the Mount, but, and he, he also sets the love of neighbor alongside love for God. The two cannot be separated. The one flows from the other. Jesus says on these two commandments, loving God and loving neighbor, all the law and the prophets depends Second, Jesus pretty much says that how you and I live this out will show whether or not we truly are His. People will know that we are His by our love. We don't seek to live this out as some way of earning Jesus' favor and enter into heaven. Get this. You, you, we need to understand this. We don't strive to live out the character of this, of, of this law to somehow earn favor with God. 
that we might go to heaven instead of hell. We strive to live this out because he has already shown us such favor. He has given us life in his spirit and promised the Sabbath rest in him. If we get this backwards, we won't be able to live it out. This commandment to love one another is not burdensome. It's life-giving. We love because we know love. We love because Jesus first loved us, giving us himself. You and I are able to uphold the law, keeping Jesus' command to love as an act of worship to the triune God who loves us. You see, our keeping of the law is indeed holy. It is otherworldly because our love is otherworldly because it reflects the one who is otherworldly. The one, Jesus Christ, who came from outside the world to give himself to us. You see, the transcendent one not only became imminent, he became perfectly intimate with us, with his creation. In Christ, God came near. And the greatest possible expression of both divine and human love. And as such, Jesus is indeed the holy fulfillment of God's holy law. And because we are his, and because his spirit resides within us, we must fulfill this holy law too. Let us pray. Father, for us to live this out will take nothing less than a miracle. It will take nothing less than you giving us your spirit, filling us with yourself. And it took nothing less than you sending your son to live it out perfectly to the point of death on a cross. Help us to die to ourselves that we might love our neighbors well. as an overflow of the love we have for you because you first loved us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.